Welcome, everybody, to episode 101 of Radicalized Truth Survives podcast. Today, Jim Hi-Fi and I are going to take you all the way to Austria to interview our friend Dietmar Pichler in Vienna. He is a disinformation expert and analyst, a media literacy trainer. He founded the Disinfo Resilience Network, and he's going to be explaining to us uh, that we are actually going through information world war. Have a listen. All right, Dietmar, we are so glad to have you here for our 101st episode of Radicalized Truth Survives podcast. As I told you, uh, the guys and I got together about three years ago to put together an investigative show on disinformation. And when my friend uh, sent me your work, I was very excited to track you down because we need allies all across the uh, the globe and can you please let our viewers know the nature of your work and how you came to focus on exposing disinformation agents so first of all thanks for having me a great honor to be here on your show um yeah a couple of words about my work i'm a media literacy trainer this is where i actually started to go more deeper into um, exposing disinformation uh, speaking also about social media but not only social media because i i have to say in the recent months i am I'm a little bit fed up about people who say disinformation is only on social media because it's not unfortunately it's not so i have a focus the focus of my work now is more on agents of influence and these things that I, I used to term mainstream media now, yeah, because we know that the conspiracy theorists, they speak a lot about the bad mainstream media, but we, I think we also have something to criticize here, yeah, that they um, invite guests to talk shows, for instance, who spread certain kind of disinformation or Russian narratives. We have a lot of, uh, also in Europe, talk shows where people that got invited uh, there is no debunking there is no fact check especially no immediate fact check we have people unfortunately also on universities who are very influential who influence our political system and this is basically what interested me mostly at the time and uh, my project the disinformation resilience network aims to bring people together who have different kinds of expertises like um, political science, international relations, but also security or in particular cybersecurity and give them some um, background. What are the most common fakes and, and, and hostile narratives by autocratic states that they can debunk in their daily work? Because there are a lot of professors, they do their research, they do very fine work, but they're not aware what um, what the mainstream discourse is in bars, in pubs, in coffee houses, and on the internet, of course. So, yeah, this is a short overview, but um, I think uh, during the talk, I will um, tell you a little bit more. Ah, oh, that was so good. It was so refreshing to hear that. And can you tell our viewers about subtle propaganda? I just want to, like, get that out uh, as quickly as possible, because that is a great term, and, uh, and it's very uh, pernicious. Yeah, the biggest problem about that is you cannot debunk it the way you can work with a fabricated uh, content or doctored images where you say, look, this is the real image, somebody manipulated it. Um, that's basic. That's that's the, that's classic. This is something you can do in media literacy classes. This is something you can do at school. But the subtle propaganda, it's more like it depends on the context and it's between the lines. And if you have somebody invited to a talk show or somebody giving a lecture and very, very crucial parts are missing, then that can be already uh, subtle propaganda. Um, I have one example. If you speak about corruption in Ukraine, it depends in which context. If you are at the five days conference for the European accession process and you speak about corruption, then it actually helps. And Ukrainians will very much appreciate that you bring that topic on the table because it concerns them a lot. 
But if somebody says that the Russian aggression is something terrible, which it is, and the other person answers, but Ukraine is so corrupted, then it is propaganda because it's not connected to um, to, to the actual thing. It's, it's, it's like a kind of distraction and it aims to demonize the victim while it somehow excuses the perpetrator. And this is some kind of... Um, dynamics we can witness a lot of times wow i've got a million questions but guys you go um I, i'm just curious about your thoughts on how to is sort of in the wild how to detect uh agents of influence um what one thing that i've i've thought of as a my own way of kind of of figuring out what's trying to influence me is to think of propaganda as an emotion that they want you to have and then the target for it, right? So in 2016, the emotion was disgust and the target was Hillary Clinton, right? In 2020, the emotion was anger and the target was Congress. And that ended up, you know, with J6. Um, and and what I've found, and because I, I consume a lot of propaganda, <laughs> is how did that make me feel, right? And who was, what was the target for that emotion? And I found that kind of going around on social media, that that's a helpful kind of heuristic, um, if, you, if you know what I mean by that. Um, I, I was just curious, sort of, what what's your advice for for while you're out there you know is trying to figure out is this person sincere or they or are they inauthentic yeah that's a good question that's the million dollar question because if we speak about agents of influence and we completely stick to the definition then this is actually somebody who works it's almost like uh, they have a deal they they get paid yeah for for the job it's not the way we use that term now because in most cases unfortunately we don't know are they paid or not and it would be wonderful to know it we have one case german journalist he wrote a book about putin he was always extremely close extremely apologetic of of putin defending him defending his policy and he was invited to TV, to many events. And suddenly in, in 2023, the world learned because of investigative, um, investigative journalism that he received 600,000 US dollar from um, oligarchs close to Putin. Yeah, And this is the best thing that ever can happen to you because now everybody understands the context of, of his communication because this guy was presented as a journalist yeah and you know if you go to media literacy classes at school then the teacher will tell you take care about social media take care about trolls maybe he if it's a good teacher he will even tell you about the troll farms in St. Petersburg but he will not tell you take care about the German journalist who appears in public TV this is the most trustful environment but unfortunately the agents of influence they are very good and we have professors we have um economic advisors yeah i don't mention any names because they love to sue people where we don't know are they actually paid or is it their ideology and then we have another term useful idiots this is i maybe somebody can sue you as well for calling him or her an idiot but uh, it's a little bit more safe because the word sells they are not paid but i think in many cases it's a kind of mixture the the, the ideology fits yeah they, they have certain anti-western views and then they spread it and to, to come back to your question how to spot them it's about what they say but it's equally important what they don't say what they fail to mention about the russian invasion i saw one pattern about every person I would categorize as an agent of influence uh, or useful idiot. This is defending Russia as much as possible, demonizing Ukraine as much as possible without getting spotted too easily, and then still having this rational aura 
it's not really rational, yeah, because they they connect to some emotions when the viewers when they say, oh yeah, I think the same, and I have this professor who tells me actually NATO provoked so much, yeah, yeah. Then we have the NATO provocation narrative, and what they never do, what they absolutely never do, they never talk deeply about the Russian occupation, about uh, torture chambers, deportation of kids, about Russification and Russian imperialism, because this does not fit their narrative. They speak about ending the war because war is always bad. Then we come to the peace movement, which was very much influenced by the KGB during the Cold War and still is. And if you if you put that all together, then it doesn't fit. You cannot speak about occupation. You cannot speak about Russian imperialism because then the whole house of cards from from the narrative that these um, people it collides. It doesn't fit. Oh my gosh, you are a gold mine. I'm hoping that you come on our show all the time to continually update people. High five. So Thank my you. question for you, Dietmar. Is, is not so much as a disinformation uh, specialist, but as an Austrian. Uh, we know from the wired card scandal and Jan Marsalek that Austria had been infiltrated in their business community by what appeared to be Russian spies. We know that the journalist Christo Grosev now must have uh, armed guards on his home because Russians have tried to kill him in Austria. Uh, we also know that former Prime Minister of Austria, Sebastian Kurz, uh, having to step down from a corruption scandal, he then went to join American oligarch Peter Thiel uh, at one of his financial firms. I, I, I follow you on Twitter. And I see you say that the Austrian government is not paying attention to disinformation. How much of this problem do you think is caused by the fact that the Austrian government has compromised individuals within it? Uh, well, first of all, we have one big um, issue that um, is a, sp a specific problem for Austria regarding infiltration, disinformation, or subversive activities. And this is our neutrality. Because basically we are just politically wise. No, we are not politically wise. Sorry, that's that's exactly the problem that we have. We are militarily <laughs> wise, neutral, which is irrelevant because we don't have weapons we could send. So that doesn't change a thing. But the big problem is that some people understand our neutrality in a way that we have, first of all, I always say it's um, neutrality towards reality. That means we don't see the world as it really is. We see it through neutral um, eyes and we know that the truth doesn't lie in the middle. And then there is this other problem that people think we need to have closer relationships to autocratic regimes than other countries, than countries that are um, part of NATO. And we see this with Russia, we see this a little bit less drastic with other countries, we see this also with China, we have a lot of um, friendship associations, we have at least, I think, 10 NGOs promoting neutrality as their main focus, wow. and all of them have issues in um, explaining the, the, the situation as it is, so they, they have... Uh, a kind of uh, false balance reporting. They have a lot of both sidedism, and in some cases, they totally blame Ukraine and the U.S. and the West. Uh, it's a very strong anti-Western um, stance in um, not only in these associations in Austria generally. So, if I compare Austria to to Germany, I would say uh, the situation in Austria. You have everything problematic you have in Germany, but in Austria it's stronger. Yeah? All yeah. these, um, except of course of um, the territory of the former GDR, there is even worse than Austria. They have a huge problem there, yeah. but this is something else. And wow. corruption, corruption doesn't help. Yeah, it doesn't help. We have <laughs> um, unfortunately very close business and economic 
ties with the Russian Federation and some people, they want to justify these ties and justify this business and our past politics by parroting Russian narratives. I just I'm just sitting here going, you know, snap, snap, snap. We have we have the same thing here in America as as Hi-Fi was rattling off these, you know, uh, you know, examples. I was thinking, yeah, we can check very similar boxes. I've got two things that I would love to cover um, with you. And one of them is your work on KGB active measures, their impact in the present, how Russia is not only using old techniques, but also benefiting from people influenced by Russian uh, Soviet propaganda before the Cold War ended, like you mentioned, the peace movement, the tankies. I just want to get our audience, particularly our new viewers, familiar with some of these techniques. Yeah, um, it's my. Um, it's not only my opinion. I think it's a fact that um, what we see now that Russia is doing not only the same as it uh, did before, plus social media nothing else and the problem is we focus on social media because it's one of the main problems but we forget everything else what they yes. did before um as far it's very difficult to do research on that topic because there is not a lot to find um it's very important to go into the archives to speak to also people who grew up in the former Soviet Union, they have a lot of information. One of your former guests already told me also a lot when, when she was in Vienna. And they, 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 what, what the Soviets did is they tried to infiltrate institutions, um, universities and, and NGOs, um, no matter if they are really very geopolitical or not. And they tried to subvert our societies and influence um, our views on the West, on NATO. And what, what I see a lot today is that the Pershing rockets, um, mo peace movement against the Pershing rockets um, in, on the early 80s, this matters more than we can imagine now, because we see that the same people who rallied back then against the rockets, they are rallying now against the military support of Ukraine and they are parroting Russian narratives. So it's all about Moscow influence in the West. And it's not only the techniques, they still have their useful idiots. They are like sleeping cells. Yeah. God, oh my God. I One more question for me, then you guys finish it off. Um, as you wrote to us, the events in Ukraine 2014, you were present in Ukraine during that time and debunked several Russian narratives. Can you talk about that? Because I think if we do not understand what happened in 2014 with the invasion uh, uh, by Russia uh, in Ukraine and the, and the misunderstanding around the world that it was actually even occurring, we're not going to be able to figure anything out. So I think it's very important we always go back to 2014. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that question, because 2014 is as crucial as this Cold War issue. Uh, it's the second thing that is in the past and matters a lot today. Um, I had uh, the chance to be in Ukraine more than 50 times since 2011, and I know the country quite well. And um, after the events 2014, the annexation of Crimea, uh, I saw a, a huge difference between what happened in Crimea and what, what happened in Donbass. Because Crimea, um, people around the world, at least the Western world, and even Austria, beside all the problems, they realized, okay, this green little man, Putin, annexation, it's part of, I mean, not legally, but he made it part of Russia. Everybody understood it's a bad thing, it's a criminal thing, and... Um, they they use their narratives to justify it with this Khrushchev story and all you know all this yeah but everybody understood at least that it was Russia not so about Donbas yeah because today we know that the Wagner Group was present that several neo Nazi group Russian neo Nazi groups were fighting there against Ukrainians. But nobody talked about it. We spoke about the far right in Ukraine a lot. And even if it's it's minimal, and we see it also in the election and, and that they are not present in the parliament, but nobody spoke about all these far right groups uh, from the Russian Federation in Eastern Ukraine. 
And I try to um, to talk to as many people as possible there, especially to the Russian speaking population and understand, are you allowed to speak Russian? Yeah. And they said, yeah, of course, it's not a problem. Yeah, it's uh, And when I was there, in, even in Kyiv after 2014, I heard more Russian language than, than Ukrainian, even patriots. Yeah. So I came back to Austria, I went to Germany, so many cities, and I was penetrated with the Russian narratives. And even I told, when I told people I was there, I can connect you to, to ethnic Russian, Russian speaking, whatever, I can tell you, you can trust me. It was very difficult. And this was an eye opener for me that I have a lot of work to do. It's a responsibility in, in my opinion. Wow. We we had a friend on, our friend who does decoding trolls and distant folklore, and he was working um, as a liaison on a bridge um, during the 2015 through 2018 period in Ukraine. And he said that he did not even know that he was witnessing a stealth genocide because the information warfare component was so powerful. I am so grateful that you took the time to be here with us today. Gentlemen, do you have further questions? Um, uh, I just wanted to follow up on on that sort of on the the Ukrainian Nazi myth, right? Um, in, in my view, it's projection. Um, I've seen a lot of of the neo Nazi movements in America and around the world really um, be influenced and helped um, by Russian. Uh, money by Russian influence, um, and for some reason, all of the neo-Nazi groups seem to be pro-Putin, <laughs> at least in America. Um, and I don't think that that's um, coincidental. I don't think it's coincidental that um, I have a, a Ukraine flag in my just in my sort of Twitter bio, right? And um, anytime I post something, I will get these people who say. Ukraine flag and bio ignore opinion, right? Um, it's it's literally a, a a sort of cliche that's been brainwashed into their heads. Um, and I just wanted to to get your your view on that. Do you see this connection between because there are literally, as you said, paramilitary Russian groups, not just Wagner and its descendants, but other ones as as well, large ones. Um, and I'm just curious if, if you've seen that kind of connection between the, the actual neo-Nazis that exist out there um, and, the, and Russian influence. Yes, it's, it's very obvious because in, in Europe, um, more than 10 years already, it's, it's 15 years and in some cases even longer that the Russian Federation has close uh, relations with the European far right parties. Now, this is this is something that is common knowledge now. But what I find very interesting that the far left, so that the tankies, yeah, the, the Soviet nostalgic far left and the peace movement, they don't have an issue with that. And I witnessed a, a discussion between a self proclaimed socialist who actually said he admired. Um, the reporting of Tucker Carlson yeah, and other far-right reporters. Yeah, this is completely ridiculous. So what, and I saw it starting in 2014 when you saw far-right and far-left um, guys, it's mostly guys, yes, in some cases also women, marching in favor of Moscow and people even denied it. They say, yeah, there's some crazy. And now it's completely mainstream in, in their scene. Yeah, they do yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, it's for me. It's and and then um, there is this narrative where they say, yeah, well, it's good that the far right um, communicates with the Kremlin and has relations and positive views because nobody else does it. The mainstream politicians don't do it. This is how some far left uh, pro Kremlin groups justify that. Yeah, and they don't recognize that the Kremlin regime is a fascist regime. It's um, even in Putin's party, it's not a, a moderate party. He has very, very radical um, neo-Nazi-like um, MPs in his party. So my question for you is um, what I'd like to actually call this episode, Information World War. 
that's a phrase that I got from you that I think is like an essential framework for the times in which we're living. Can you please speak on that? Because clearly we have an authoritarian bloc. They're trying to capture America right now. They just may do it. And what? how, how do we use that phrase, information world war, to really alert people to what's happening and, and direct them to take action? Um, I think it's again helpful to go back to the Cold War because back then we had a similar situation. We had even similar um, partnerships between countries, similar alliances. Mm -hmm. And we see basically which uh, countries Rus Russia is closely cooperating with. Mostly of them are authoritarian or at least in the case of India, very problematic, uh, flawed democracies. And yeah, it's very sad yeah, that Brazil is part of this um, because of the government and the BRICS connection. And I see there is an information war and an ideological war going on between the BRICS plus community and the West, the so-called West. And what is interesting about this, that these countries, I mean, India and China, they have their problems, yeah? they are rivals, they have even border issues. But it doesn't matter for them if it's against the West, if it's uh, together with Russia. Same Saudi Arabia and um, Iran. Mm -hmm. We remember that for decades, the West appeased Saudi Arabia. We were very um, friendly towards Saudi Arabia. And many people criticized us for that. They said, OK, it's OK that you're tough on Iran, but you should be also on Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is part of the BRICS bloc. And against the West, yeah, and together with Russia, very close to, to Russia. And they, of course, synchronize also their propaganda efforts. And I remember um, that um, after a few days after the full scale invasion, when Russia Today and Sputnik uh, got blocked in the European Union, Venezuela um, streamed on their television channels in English the Russian propaganda about Ukrainian bioweapons. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, but you know, it works for some people. So they cooperate and even if they have issues between each other, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, you know this saying, and they work in that way. So it's China, it's Russia, it's Iran, it's North Korea. You can see on Instagram, they, there are Instagram bloggers and influencers who tell you that actually in North Korea, everything is all right. <laughs> I mean, I laugh, but it is not funny because yeah, it's yeah. so incredibly real. Um, uh, any any final thoughts? Because that was a brilliant interview. High fidelity. It just seems to me that too many people are being influenced by information that is fed to them through a screen. And perhaps we should stop that. Yeah, I don't know how. I mean, you know, like Jim talks about, we use our our information platforms now uh, like public utilities. And just like we have clean water protections, or we did, clean air protections, or we did, we need protections from the toxicity of information warfare. So maybe that's where we will pick it up um, next time you join us, because I'm assuming you won't mind coming back because we sure liked having you. Thank you very Thank you. much.